go rent the countertops of all the liquor stores and then go to Nabisco or one of the big boys and be like, hey, guess what? I own 10,000 countertops. You want to put your <laughs> widget there? You want to put your fucking widget there? Keep the money warm, Sean. Yeah, keep the money warm, baby. <laughs> okay, everyone, what's going on? This is Sam. We have Jesse Itzler on the pod today. Very fascinating guy. He started a bunch of different companies. Um, the biggest one being Marquee Jets, which we got into some of the economics of that business. And... Then he's done a bunch of other things. You see him on social media. He's done a lot of stuff, but like his life advice was actually really amazing. Um, we went deep into some of the numbers behind some of his businesses. We um, learned about his early career and there's like a, a ton of takeaways. The pod was only supposed to be 60 minutes long, but Sean and I were like so into it that we went over. I think we went w like 90 minutes, something like that, because his story is super fascinating. If you like the Rob Deerdick episode, which a lot of people did, it's I think our most listened two episode of all time. I think you're really going to like this one. Um, this was pretty spectacular. I left feeling good uh, about it. And if you're watching this on YouTube, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button and make a comment because we've had a ton of people comment on our videos lately and a ton of people subscribe. We see the data behind it. So it's awesome that you guys are doing this. And it means a ton of us. We actually text each other all the time when someone makes a funny comment. So let us know. And if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, hit that download or the subscribe button, whatever it is on those platforms, because we get notifications about those too. And it's awesome. We're killing it. We're growing a ton and we appreciate the army of people who are supporting us. All right. Enjoy the episode. Let us know in the YouTube comments what you think. Um, all right. Well, welcome. We got Jesse Itzler here, um, also known as, I think you might be the richest runner white rapper in the country so congratulations my friend <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we we are excited to have you here i love that if you keep adding categories i could be the richest in the world if you start adding like you know that have four kids that um, eat plant-based etc cetera, etc cetera. so right on so you know i'm excited to talk to you because you've done a bunch of amazing things we've talked about you on the pod and uh, we sort of spoke it into existence i think we talked about it somebody might have sent you a clip i'm not sure but you, uh, you reached out and said, hey, I'd love to come on. You have, I'm just going to read a couple of these things. So I'm going to flatter you real quick, just so that the audience uh, understands kind of just your background. So like we said, started out uh, trying to make it as a rapper and ended up creating a, a, a jingles company. So you were making jingles for, for sports teams, ended up selling that, then created uh, Marquee Jets, a fractional jet owning company, sold that to Berkshire Hathaway, which Warren Buffett obviously runs and owns. Uh, you're married to Sarah Blakely, founder of Spanx. You are an epic sort of fitness athlete yourself. So uh, prolific runner. I read your book. Uh, the, the day I got really into you is when I read Living with a Seal, which is the story of you living with uh, David Goggins for 30 days. Um, I can't even really listen. I gave David Goggins for 30 minutes on a podcast. Uh, so living with him for 30 days, respect. And um, yeah, you've created a bunch of companies outside of that partner with Zico Coconut Water and, and doing a bunch of prolific things. So you have a a very prolific career, but the start was uh, like anybody. It was humble, humble beginnings. So, talk about the early days when you were you were trying to do the the. Uh, let's start with the jingle company. You um, you told me you were you were sleeping on couches at the time, trying to make it. And uh, describe kind of what was going on at that time in your life. What was the plan, and what were you going through, and how did you come out of that? Well, I grew up in New York in the eighties when rap and hip hop was starting to emerge in a bigger way. And that it that was the intersection of, of that happening and me going to college. So I was really into music early on. And while all of my friends in college were writing resumes and going on job interviews, I was like, I'm making a rap record. Like, I, I'm, why would I waste my time making a resume? I want to make an album. So it was like kind of that's the direction I wanted to go in. Uh, right away. I ended up signing with a record company called Delicious Vinyl. Everybody passed on me and this one little record company gave me a shot and I didn't have, met, like I wasn't super connected. I didn't have like a lawyer. I, no, I did it all. I shopped it myself, but I ended up getting dropped from the label shortly after and I got into writing um, jingles or uh, for companies and theme songs for sports teams and that was kind of my first entree into 
you know, I pivoted. It, it didn't work out for me in the music business, but I still loved music. So I stayed in there and I started doing jingles and, um, yeah, that's how I kind of started out early on. You told me you were sleeping on couches, um, trying to make it, and somebody offered you a tempting deal. They said, yeah. I'll give you $10,000 if I can get 10% of everything you'll ever make. H how did that happen, and w what was your answer? Right, so I was, I was writing theme songs for sports teams. I was 22, 23 years old, and my business model was to write a song on spec, and then cold call a professional sports team, try to get a meeting with them, try to like, you know, get in there. And then if I was able to get that meeting, convince them that they needed a theme song. And that was my business model. And at the time I was, I was, I was bouncing around from couch to couch. I wasn't homeless, but my friends were, I just moved to New York from Los Angeles and my friends were putting me up as I tried to figure out how to do it. I had no money to go in the studio to write any more songs on spec. So I needed money to fund that production. So a music manager said, you know, I, I believe in you. I'll give you 10 grand for 10%, but I want to own you for the rest of your life, basically 10% of anything you make. And I was like, I'll take it because <laughs> I needed the money to go in the studio. I thought it was a deal of the century. You're going to give me 10 grand and all I'm going to do is pay you if I make it? Like that sounded amazing to me. At the time I was living on my friend, Melissa Katz uh, couch. I met her actually at a bar and she had given me her number on a napkin and said, if you're in an emergency, she asked me where I lived. And I said, as of Monday, I have nowhere to live. I was getting kicked out of my friend's house on Monday. She said, if it's an emergency, you can come live with my roommate and I. Monday, my friend kicked me out because his parents were coming for a week. And I'm like, this is an emergency. <laughs> so I was living at Melissa's house and I told her about this opportunity. And she said, well, why don't you go talk to my father before you give away 10% of your future earnings? And as it turned out, her father was a very successful entrepreneur. He owned a company called Kinney Parking, Parking Garages in New York and was, um, I think, the second largest shareholder of the New York Yankees. You're like, Melissa, your apartment is really nice. <laughs> what was amazing about that was it really wasn't. And that's why I really was taken aback by, I knew her dad was an entrepreneur. I didn't know the extent. And, um, she, you know, she sent me on... By the way, his name is Lou Katz. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was an incredibly influential guy in my life. And this was my first encounter with him. So I went to, not to belabor this, but I went to see him. And it's, it's really relevant for anyone listening, what he said to me as a 22-year-old. he I told him my dilemma, I'm going to take 10 grand for 10% of my life. And he said to me, he is exactly what he said to me. He said, Jesse, you know, will you make this business work without the 10 grand? I said, Lou, I'm onto something. I know I can make it work. There's a, I know I can. And he, he took his notebook and he literally threw it on the ground. And he said, I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask you, can you? I said, will you? Mm. There's a big difference between can and will. I know you can start a podcast. I know you can be a millionaire. I know you can run a marathon. I, I said, will you, son? And I said, yeah, will, Lou, I will. He said, well, tell him to take the $10,000 and shove it up his ass. Go make it work. <laughs> and I did. You know, like it was a really powerful lesson. And like, you know what? I signed up for this journey as an entrepreneur. Let me go figure it out. Let me go. That's what I want to do. Let me go figure this out. And he, he, breathed, he blew that flame into me at an early age. And um, it's really been a theme throughout my life and all the buckets of my life. The, the whole will versus can notion, you, you know? And why, why is that so powerful, the will versus can? Well, because it's it really puts the pressure, you know, Billie Jean King in a book, Pressure's a Privilege, and it is. Like, entrepreneur, we play for pressure, Sean. Like, as entrepreneurs, that's what we want, man. And, um, you know, I recently did a race called Ultraman. It's a 6.2-mile open water swim, a 265-mile bike, and a 52.4-mile run. And I thought to myself before the race, that exact thing, like, I think I can do it, but I'm never going to know unless I sign up for the race, put myself in a position where something incredible can happen or not, but I got to put myself in that situation. And now it's up to me, like, will I get it done? You know, will, what am I willing to do? Am I willing to suffer for that one day for, to have the next 
for three decades, have that in my memory bank and have it on my resume. And and I and I am will and I am willing to do that. And and I did. So you know what's really funny? Uh, after you told me that, so I did a call with you the other day to just prep for the for the pod. Say, hey, you know, uh, we're going to talk about. I'm thinking about talking about this, this, and this. You have any good stories? And you told me this this Will versus Can thing. And uh, the next day, <laughs> my wife was literally like, she's like, hey, can you take out the trash? And I was like, no, 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 baby. It's not about can I take out the trash. I will take out the trash. And she has no idea what I'm doing. And I've been doing it all weekend. I've been, because it's, once you see it, it's actually everywhere. Uh, ben texted Ben, who's listening on this thing right now. He texted me this morning. He's like, um, he's like, hey, how'd you eat this weekend? We're, we're both like on a, a fitness kick. He's like, can you stay locked in from now till Thanksgiving? And I just, I was like, oh, Ben. You ask me, can but we don't ask can questions anymore? Mm -hmm. As of meeting yeah. Jesse Itzler, I no longer ask can I. It's will I or won't I? That's it. Well, think about how many times in your life someone said you you say something that you've done, like you know I did you know rim to rim. I'll, I'll take physical activities or I climb Kilimanjaro, and you explain to someone they're like, oh, I can, I can do that, and I you're like my, in the back of your head you're like, yeah, you probably can, but. You know, will you do it? You know, <laughs> there's just like it's a huge difference between like, oh, just checking the box because you said to yourself, I can, versus actually going through and doing it. By the way, Jesse, I have one other story that you you don't know about. Uh, so you used to go to something, uh, at least you went once, called Coach K's Fantasy Camp. Is that correct? I've been there for uh, 18 straight years. Okay, okay, perfect. That's hilarious. So you went to this thing. So for those who don't know, Coach K, he was the the greatest college basketball coach at, at Duke. I went to Duke and um, my roommate, Trevor, used to volunteer at Coach K's fantasy camp and volunteer was literally volunteering. I was like, so what are you, you're staying over from break? Cause it's like during some break. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going home. I'm going to work this thing. I'm like, cool. How much are you getting paid? He's, uh, he's like, I don't think we really get paid, but uh, you know, whatever. Like you just said, put himself in a position for something good to happen. And so, he, and what I did, what he didn't know and what I didn't know was, the only people who go to this camp that costs like 10 grand to go to are basically like business ballers trying to like live out their dream of like, oh, as if I was an athlete. And he's he so he all he was doing was driving the shuttle back and forth between where y'all were staying and the thing. And he's like, dude, it's amazing. He's like, just hearing these conversations, what they're talking about in this like nine minute shuttle ride. He's like, every night he would debrief with me ideas that he heard. He's like, oh, this guy said that he does this, this thing over here. This guy said he does this. And he told me, he goes, I met this guy, super charismatic, like this guy. He loved this guy's energy. He goes, and he tipped me a hundred bucks for this like 10 minute shuttle ride. And he, late, I told him, he, I told uh, I was mentioning to him that you're coming on the pod. He goes, that was the guy who tipped me. So I don't know if you remember this or not, but we took that tip and uh, we had a business idea at the time and we needed to convince this uh, famous chef in LA to come fly out and partner with us. We had no money. And so you, you plus a little like a side job that I had became the money we paid for, for the ticket to fly that guy out, which definitely changed the trajectory of our life. So little did you know. I, I love that. And um, yeah, I've been going there for, since I'm 35, it's for guys 35 and older. And it's not to chase some, some crazy dream. It's a combination of, you know, um, meeting amazing people and also kind of like, there's not a lot of times, I'm 55, so I'm, I'm older than you guys. And um, I can't stop that clock, you know. I, time's undefeated; it's always ticking. It's it's the six days a year, the five days I go there, that I get to feel like an eight year old again. And it's really one of the few times in my life that I get that chance, and I love it. I don't know, man. I follow you on Instagram. It seems like you live like an eight year old a lot of times. <laughs> I'm pretty sure lot, I just. I, a lot of, I do. I do. I do. I do. I shouldn't say that. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure I just saw you like in an RV with like eight friends, just like running around the like country it seems like you <laughs> yeah it seems like you got the eight-year-old life kind of nailed down i like to give myself that excuse sam i guess you put your right it's more than once a, more than five days a year yeah i i think i think you've done that all right you uh and then was your first um kind of major business marquee jet so you went from did you go from jingles to jets yeah so interestingly i had so the jingle thing turned into a real business i found an opportunity I started out doing jingles just for anyone that would pay me anything to do anything. So um, <laughs> I was doing jingles for like, I, 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 honestly, like Turbo Bubblegum, this like bubble book gum company that no one ever heard of, like just anything that hey, would pay me. Our podcast intro needs a little sprucing up if you want to, if you want to dust it off. Yeah. I, I, I got you guys. And, um, and then I start, and then one of those jingles 
gave me an opportunity to write a theme song for the New York Knicks. I had done a a commercial, a radio ad for a company called In the In the Pain Clothing. It was owned by um, Nancy Grunfeld, Ernie Grunfeld, the GM of the Knicks, white. And she really liked what we had, what I had done. And she said, um, yeah, if you have any other ideas, you know, let me know. I said, well, I'd love to do something for the Knicks, you know, like write a theme song and we could shoot a video. They can sing it in the arena. So I, I approached the Knicks to do this song called Go New York Go. And um, the Knicks paid me $4,000 to buy the song outright. I'll never forget it. Like, um, I actually borrowed money to go in the studio to do this, to do the song. I didn't have enough money to go in the studio to record it because they were paying me 30 or 60 days later. And by the time I paid the studio, the engineer, the lawyer that I had, the singer, the producer, it cost me $4,800 to actually deliver the song that they were paying me $4,000 for. And when I look back on it, you know, for most people, they'd be like, that's a terrible business model. It was the best business model in the world for me because when you start out, you know, people buy into stories, momentum, and people very often more than the products. Like I was the business plan and I would have paid the Knicks 10 grand to say they were my customer. Because once I had the Knicks, those phone calls to get into the other sports teams became very easy. And that became my calling card. So I built a business around that, Sean, that actually I, I ended up doing theme songs for almost every professional sports team and turned it into a business where we were selling CDs, like this, I would take the songs they play in the arena, add my original song with great moments in the team history and sell them at retail. I sold that company to a public company called SFX. And that was my first, I was 27. We sold it for 4 million bucks. And then we had, there was an earn out for another 12 or 16 or something, which we earned out. And that was my first kind of like get off the couch moment. I was no longer on Melissa's couch and I moved into my own space. What was your take home after that? I had a partner and at the end of the day, I think the, on the first 4 million, I made like a million and a half or, but by the way, a million and a half dollars to me. All the money. I was Elon Musk. <laughs> Before Musk was born, I was walking around like I was Musk. I had a million and a half dollars. I would go to the, wake up at the eight and go to the ATM. I would get my, a printout of my balance. Swear to God. Then I would wake up the next morning and be like, are you fucking kidding me? I have 300 more dollars than I had yesterday and I was sleeping. I'm like, I'm going it's back like to bed. A... I'm going back to bed. <laughs> Shit, I'm making more money than that. <laughs> my partner convinced me to take all $1.3 million that we both cleared after taxes or whatever it was and reinvest it to, to, to get like exclusive deals in all this, like we made the business, we reinvested it in the business and actually made the business a lot bigger and we got our earn out. And then, then everything changed a little bit for me. But you know, I had no idea how to manage money. My parents never talked about money. My dad owned the plumbing supply house. Um, my mom raised four kids. The, the thing, the, our, I had no relationship with money. That might sound weird, but like people talk about relationships with in terms of their relationship with their kids or their significant other, but not in terms of their relationship with time, which is very important, and your relationship with money, which is equally as important. I had no relationship with money. So when I got money, I didn't know how to save it, how to spend it, how to use it, how to act around it. I was very immature around new money. And you know what happened to me then? I lost it because I didn't know anything about it. And fortunately, I, I was able to bounce back through having other successful businesses and failures, but no one ever told me about it. How'd you lose it? Just overspending or what'd you do? Overspending, thinking like, oh, that was pretty easy, man. I could just, I could do that again, you know? Um, what did you buy? It wasn't like so much what I bought. It was just, you know, helping my parents, spreading it out. I wasn't abusive with it, like, but just, I didn't know how to really handle that. And that's pretty common, right? Like, you know, Sean and I have a bunch of friends that, you know, we're both about 34, 35, and we have a bunch of friends and ourselves as well who had exits at a young age. And the thing about selling a company, it's different than 
th there's usually two types of people I've noticed is people who have cash flow businesses or they're like a lawyer or something like that. Or they own a law firm, something where your like income is going up a nice amount every year and you get used to having that cash flow. And then the other group of people are typically young folks who sell their company. And typically those people are like me, where I paid myself $20,000 year one, $20,000 year two, year three was $50,000, year four, I sell it and make a lot of money. And you're like, this is just overwhelming. I don't know what to do with this. And yeah. that's like a pretty... That's like a pretty common thing is I, I don't think I don't, I don't know if most people blow it, but I think it takes about two or three years to accumulate uh, and, and kind of get used to and learn what to do. But there's no one to teach you. The problem is I, I'd always been taught, oh, if you're a mil like a millionaire was that ain't shit. Was the, no, but I've been no, I've been taught the opposite. Like if I saw a millionaire, that was like the pinnacle. Like he's a millionaire, right. man. So I was thought like, oh, I have a million dollars. That's all I need to have for the rest of my life. I'm a millionaire at 27. And that's that was the relationship that was wrong. Right. Yeah, you could spend that. You could spend that easy. Yeah, you go out and you have a four thousand dollar dinner when you were eating. When I was basically eating a ninety nine cent bagel for seventeen years, you know, <laughs> things change quick. You, um, I, I'm a big believer that most of life, uh, most of your life, kind of is a result of this. The conversation you have with yourself in your head. Do you remember after you kind of had that first hit? and you see the money and you still have, you're only 27, you still got all your life ahead of you. Do you at all remember like the conversation you had with yourself? Like, all right, Jesse, so like now X and whether X was a good, a good, a good conversation with yourself or misleading one, do you remember what, what the conversation you had with yourself at that point in time was? You know, it was interesting because Sean, I was living in New York and most of my friends were working on Wall Street. They were working at hedge funds. They were making, they were making a lot of money around. There was a lot of money around me. And, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in what's he making versus what am I making? And it's very easy to like, you start having those conversations with, you, with yourself. You can go down and spiral downward very quickly. And, you know, what I was making, what it took me years to make and build and sell and my journey to get to that point was crazy. I was selling carrot and cel celery sticks door to door. That didn't work. I had a t-shirt company. That didn't work. I got dropped from a record label. That didn't work. I, I cleaned meat trucks. That didn't work. I sold chicken, shrimp, and meat door to door. That didn't work. I mean, uh, jingle company. I, it went on and on. So, you know, I had really worked so hard. And, and at the same time, like I had invested so much, not for the money, but just like I just wanted to get a record deal, man. I didn't care about the money. I just wanted, everyone said, you can't do it. Everybody. And it was, it was such a driver. If I remember, I listened to a podcast where one of you guys were with Laird Hamilton and you were saying how that, he was saying how that, you know, one of you guys were saying you need that anger to inspire you, like need some kind of fuel, you know? So, um, I had that. I still have that. Don't get me wrong. I still have that. And I'm, I never want to lose that underdog mentality. I never want to be like, I'm at the top of the mountain. I, I'm not. I consider myself back of the pack everything. Back of the pack sales, back of the pack entrepreneur. There's so many better entrepreneurs than me. Um, so many better salesmen than me. But I, I, but I love that feeling of I got to prove myself. So when I, the money happened, it was just like, oh, Steve Stark is making so much more than me. We're in the same basketball run. Like I got to catch Stark, <laughs> you know, the, um, the Marky jet thing. That's interesting though. Cause that's like totally out of left field. So, you, and, and that seemed like a, a, a way bigger win than the jingle and business. Same partner, right? Same, same co-founder. Yeah. Same partner. Um, it was a much bigger win and it was like most things in my life. Um, they, most of the businesses that have, that I've been involved with, weren't planned, you know, and most of my successes in life haven't been in my business plan. They've been opportunities that presented themselves. You know, my whole life I've been taught when opportunity knocks, you know, and I'm not, I don't want to sit around waiting for opportunity to knock. I like to create my own, my own opportunity. And I was a guest on a private jet with my partner. And I was like, you, people fly, like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? this that I'm on. And we, it led to some research, like there's only really two or three ways to fly privately back in the nineties. When we started marquee jet, you can buy your own airplane. If you had $50 million, you know, or something like that. Well, that's out of the question. You could get a fractional 
being a fractional program like NetJets, but even that is a really big commitment, both in capital and time. It's a five-year commitment, a lot of money up front. That wasn't, I mean, that wasn't an option for us. Or you could charter. And there were a lot of questions around, well, who owns the plane? Who are the pilots? You know, do I feel comfortable on that? What if the plane doesn't show up? So we found the little white space there and said, you know, we only want to fly like 25 hours a year. And I bet there's a lot of people like us that don't want to own an airplane, don't want the responsibility, but they just want to be able to have the um, have a plane available on short notice. And that was the idea around selling a 25-hour jet card that would work like, work like a debit card. So if, if, you and, if you and Sam, Sean, flew two hours, you'd have 23 hours left. And then we partnered with NetJet. Again, part of being an entrepreneur is figuring out how to get from A to B the fastest. And for us, for me in my life, many times it's been through partnership. We partnered with NetJets. They ended up buying us to use their airplanes. Partnered with Coca-Cola at Zico, at Zico Coconut Order. They ended up buying us. Um, so, but anyway, that was that's what happened. We were guests on the plane and, you know, walking around eyes wide open looking for opportunities and said, wow, this could be really interesting. And, uh, and then started the journey of figuring out how we could pull this off because we had no aviation experience, very little money. And, you know, I was younger than you guys. I was 28, 29 years old. And um, figuring out, like, man, we need a lot of airplanes. Where do we go for airplanes? And uh, and then started that journey of of building this company. So you walk in, you walk into NetJets, and you're like, hey, uh, I'm Jesse, former rapper, jinglepreneur, <laughs> and I would like for you to give me your most valuable assets, your planes, for this new membership program. How did you convince them to do that? Well, at first we didn't. They kicked us out of the office. <laughs> in the first meeting after about 12 minutes. <laughs> and um, backing that up, the bigger question is how we even get in the room. Forget like what happened at the meeting. How in the world did a multi-billion dollar company let two kids that didn't break a thousand on their SATs into a room to pitch them the idea? A year before that, I was a yes guy my whole life. I, I, I was, I, I've, I've kind of, and I still try to pride myself when people ask me for things to deliver, if I can, but never ask for anything in return. You know, like, I'm not like, oh, Sam, I'll do this for you, Sean, but like, can you do this for me? Like, I don't know, that's not the MO. I got a call a year before that from someone that said that their daughter, this is a true story and it's the craziest story ever. <laughs> this guy was having a, his daughter was having a sweet 16 and Chris, um, a famous singer was performing in his hometown. His daughter wanted to bring her Sweet 16 to the event. The guy says, I know you know the manager. Can you help, help this guy get some tickets and do anything special? Turns out I get the, the guy's daughter as a backup singer for one song with the mic off. <laughs> Everyone in school the next day is, she's like the hero of this. Like, what happened? Oh my God, they're freaking out. The guy calls me up. He goes, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you, have, what you do. But you lit my daughter up, and if you ever need anything, let me know. Like, turns out, he I can't make this up. He's the president of NetJets. A year later, <laughs> I need 650 airplanes. <laughs> I call him up, I'm like, Jim, you're never going to believe this. The, the guy who got your daughter on, I have an idea for a thing. He gets me the meeting. We get thrown out of the meeting 12 minutes in because they're like, we're not giving two kids access to our 650 airplanes. And this guy, Jim Jacobs, comes up to me after the meeting. He goes, you know what? That was amazing. I said, we got thrown out in 12 minutes. What do you mean to me? He goes, Rich Santulli, my partner, he doesn't give anyone 12 minutes. He goes, this is something. He come back next week and bring this thing to life. Repitch it. I need more information. So we came back the next week and we realized we could never sell them in a PowerPoint, which is like what everyone, guy sees 100 PowerPoints every year. We brought in our own focus group. We had eight people in the lobby mm. and they walked in one by one. And they stood up and said that they would never buy a fraction of an airplane, what NetJets was selling, but they would buy a 25-hour jet card. And at the end of the meeting, they literally said, if you guys raise money or put up your own money, if you can figure it out, we'll give you a shot. And a, a couple of years later, we had more customers than NetJets. That's crazy. You showed him the market. You were like, I could either put up a chart or a pie chart right here. Or I could literally walk the market into the room and have them say, I need this product. And it, it turns out that eight people saying, I need this product to your face makes a bigger impact than a pie chart that says 11% of the market needs this. When I think back on this moment 
at 28 years old. And we had like Carl Banks from the New York Giants. I think Run from Run DMC was there. It was right behind me on the wall. Um, you know, when these guys- At that we, meeting? Yeah, we brought, we brought him in. We brought him in. And when we said, when, when, when we, they got up one by one and explained why this card would work. And, you know, I think what they realized was they had been pitching to a, a much older corporate client. And that they, what they realized, I think, in the meeting was, here are these two 27-year-old kids. And by the way, remember I said people buy into people's stories and momentum? This had nothing to do with our product. The decision maker looked us in the eye and said, I see enthusiasm. I see someone that's no matter what, even they have, though they have no aviation experience, is going to make this work. And I'm willing to bet on these two guys. It wasn't, there was no PowerPoint. It was us. Like, you're the business plan. You are the business plan. So at the end of the meeting, he literally said to us, after we got the deal and you know, like year one, we did, a, I think we did like close to 200 million in sales year one. And I remember going into his office and, and asking, I said, Rich Santulli, who is like, he knighted me, man. He knighted me. I said, Rich, how do we, how do we end up here, man? And he looked me dead in the eye and he goes, you guys remind me of me when I was 27. And bringing in this focus group, yes, they came in and they explained why they would buy a card. And yes, they saw a much younger demo that someone could be a lifetime customer now at 25 versus a lifetime customer at 50. So they saw the lifetime value of what we were bringing in, this younger generation of athlete, entertainer, you know, young mogul, et cetera, that they wanted that because that's incredibly valuable to get that person on their plane at a young age. But at the end of the day, they, he saw something in my, Penny and I, my partner and I, that he wanted to bet on. And, you know, I just want to say this for, for anyone listening here, because I know this is primarily a business podcast. By the way, it took me 37 minutes to warm up, but now I'm fully here. <laughs> He's here. I'm slow, I'm slow today, but I got it now. Um, you know... Like I said, that was never in our business plan. Oh, we're going to bring in our own focus group to start a company that does $5 billion in sales. It's like, it's the things that live off the, the business plan that make the biggest difference. And when you have a chance, you, you know, you don't get a lot of big me meetings like that. And I remember at 27, walking in there and saying to my partner, like, this is as big as it gets because you know what? There is no one else that has 650 airplanes. This is it. And... um. You have to bring that meeting to life. You have to stand out. You have to, you know, not in a gimmicky way, but you have to make that memorable, man. And and fortunately, we were able to do that. And, and it worked. And then we had an amazing, amazingly fruitful relationship and partnership with NetJets until we exited. Our software is the worst. Have you heard of HubSpot? See, most CRMs are a cobbled together mess, but HubSpot is easy to adopt and actually looks gorgeous. I think I love our new CRM. Our software is the best. HubSpot, grow better. All right, everyone, a quick break. You're listening to this episode. You've maybe listened to a bunch of MFM episodes. We get a lot of interesting insights. And the reason we get insights is I have a lot of peers and friends who are CEOs of companies, and I'm able to ask them all types of different questions. And it all started because I used to run this event called HustleCon, and I would like convince these speakers of big startups. You know, you've probably heard of most of these companies, the founder of Grammarly, WeWork, Away, Travel, Casper, all these cool companies. And I would sit in the green room with them, and I would hear all these amazing stories, but I would also be able to learn like how to fire someone effectively, how to, how to handle things when the business isn't going well, how to handle things when it's going great, like all these stuff that happens behind closed doors, and it changed my life. And so I started this company, it's called Hampton joinhampton.com is the URL, where we make it really easy to have a peer group and have a network of other entrepreneurs that are like you, similar industries, similar size companies. And so if you do run a company, check it out. The average company is doing about 25 million in revenue. Some companies go all the way up to two, three, 400 million in revenue, and they're publicly traded. Others are a little bit smaller in the one, two, three, four range. But my partner and I, Joe, we review every single interview and we hand curate and hand select all these interesting people. So it's been a really wonderful community. So if you want to be a little less lonely, if you want to find information and insights that you can't Google, check it out. It's Hampton. That's the name of the company. And joinhampton.com is the URL. So you should check it out. I review all the interviews. So uh, enjoy the rest of the episode. Are you, um, 
so like I, I, I think that all three of us might be a, a, a bit similar in, in business relationships where we're like we bring the passion and some of the creativity and the zero to one stuff. Were you good at running that company or were you or did you have a good partner who was running it and you were great at kind of bringing some of the deals to fruition? I can only run marathons. I can't run any business. I'm not good at running anything. No, I'm a terrible operator. I'm a terrible manager, but I'm really good at knowing that I'm terrible at that and being okay with it. So, you know, we were able to hire a CEO right away. Um, and then, which allowed me to focus on sales, which I was, which I was better at buzz, which I was really good before the, before Instagram, I'm not so good at the, uh, now with Instagram, but back when there was no Instagram, I was good at creating PRable opportunities and and talk worthy events. And um for my era, that was really important. So no, um I have never I've never been the CEO of a business. I've never ran or operated a business, but I've been a founder, I think, five times. And how'd that model work? Is it like a Costco model where you were breaking even on the two hundred million in sales, but you made money off the uh, membership? No. So we the original deal with NetJets was we were leasing time on their planes, but I wouldn't have to. We wouldn't have to enter into a long-term lease until we sold it. So we had no risk. They were carrying all the paper. So if I bought, if you and if Sam, Sean, you guys bought a hundred hours, we'd go buy a hundred hours, and it was marked up. So we were just a marketing organization. They owned and operated the planes, and we were leasing it. As we got big, all of a sudden, you know, we have. 4,000 members were doing a billion dollars a year. Then the model changed and we had to start buying our airplanes. But by that time we had, you know, significant cash and we were able to do that. So it started off with literally, it was an incredible deal for us and for them. Um, it was a true um, no lose for both parties. And that, those headline numbers are really big. How big was that exit? I mean, that's a that's a pretty big thing. How big is NetJets? I don't even know. Uh, I don't even remember what NetJets sold to Berkshire for. I'm sure it's public. This was before Berkshire owned it? Is that right? NetJets sold it to Berkshire prior to us. Okay. And then and then we went to, now we're part of NetJets. Now T-Jets, now part of NetJets. Did you get, just, which did is you get all, Berkshire all stock? Because that would have been a good stock to just get in the deal. I know, right? No, we didn't. NetJets sold for seven twenty five, seven hundred twenty five million in ninety eight, um, and half of it was paid in stock. So that was um, if if th that was a good deal for NetJets, depending on if I don't have. know what the revenue was, but that, that's a lot of money. You um, you snapped your fingers and you were like, uh, we did first year we did whatever I forgot what you said two hundred million or something two hundred. I don't know what that means. What what is two hundred million there? That, that's not that can't be membership dues. That's that would be insane. No, it is. Yeah, no, because our our average our average customer spent close. To, I think it was two hundred and fifty or two hundred thirty five thousand dollars a year. Gotcha. Okay, but and so, it's more like a GMV. So because you have to, so your take is some spread between that and then whatever net just. Okay, gotcha. So, yeah, I guess like on on that model, what's the income on two hundred? Uh, let's just say a hundred million. What what can your profit be on that? Well, this is thirty years ago, so how about, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was enough that I was now off the couch <laughs> and living a very good life. And uh, and by the way, the best ROI in that deal is I met my wife there. She was a customer of ours, and that's how I met my wife. Um, you you said you you told me something which was about getting the first customer. So before your wife was even a customer, uh, you know, you're like I'm on this plane. I'm like, holy shit, this is an amazing way to fly. I'd love to do this. I'm sure other people would love to do this. You come up with the idea. Cool. Now, how do you go get those first people to give you $200,000 to be a part of this, right? That's like a, a huge, like, where did you go find those customers and and tell the story of kind of how you got it off the ground? Well, we were start, we started out, you know, I think the first thing that any entrepreneur, most entrepreneurs, at least in our position in, at more key jet is we had to establish credibility because if I was going to sell you time on a plane and you said, who flies with, who flies with you guys? That would be my first question or one of them. And I said, oh, my dad and my next door neighbor, you probably would leave. But if I was like, you know, Oprah, Bill Clinton, you'd be like, wow, they must have vetted this, you know? So we started out looking for athletes, entertainers, and, and high profile people, um, which was not easy for me. Um, but I had to go where wealthy people congregated. And I heard about this you know, they could afford time on a jet. I heard about a conference in Monterey, California that was just getting some traction called Tent. So yeah. I flew out to Monterey and um, 
you know, I told the guys like, hey, I'm going to go get my first sale. I'm going to the thing called a TED Talk. They were like, what? <laughs> you know? Who's TED? And it, it's in Monterey, California. You got to like, you can't even get there. You have to like, I connected through Chicago into whatever, rented a car five hours in Monterey. I get to the TED. It's like Fort Knox, man. Everybody <laughs> has a credential, like this, like huge. And I'm like, you need a credential to get in here? There's no credentials to be found. So I'm thinking like, how am I going to sneak in, buy someone's pass, like go into the room where all the qualified leads are. I'm in this coffee shop plotting, like, you know, my, my, my entrance or how I'm going to do it. And every two hours, a wave of people come in and they're buying, they have these credentials. And I'm like, oh, this is where they come on their break. And they're all buying lattes and muffins and these lattes and muffins and whatever. Lattes and muffins. So the next morning I got up at five and I bought all the muffins from this. I controlled all the muffin inventory in Monterey, California. And I literally just waited. And this is a true story, by the way. And it's it's been verified. You can walk. So two hours later, this guy, uh, the first wave of people on the break walk in and the guy orders a latte and a muffin. I stop him. Uh, they tell him that, that they can give him a latte, but they're all out of muffins. It's like fucking nine in the morning. He's like, you're out of muffins. The guy starts walking. I stop him. Like, sorry, I overheard you. I actually have an extra muffin if you want a muffin. And uh, he's like, you got an extra muffin? I'm thinking like, I got every single fucking muffin <laughs> under the table, man. What do you need? And um, I started talking to him. He's like, you know, what do you hear? I'm here for the conference. I'm like, me too. What do you do? I tell him what I do. He said, you got to be kidding me. I'm in the market for a private jet card. And his name was Josh Koppelman. He owned a company called Half.com. Famous VC. Right? Oh, he's amazing. Now he is. I bumped into him like three years ago at a, at a retreat. And, and we, were, we were talking about this. And anyway, he was my first sale. <laughs> he was my first sale. And, and that is not a story of me being a good sales rep. Because like I said, I am truly back of the pack. But it is an example of me putting myself in a situation, will versus can, of putting myself in a situ situation where I could attract that kind of luck. You know, and and um, he was my first sale, though, Sean, to answer your question. And and you know what happened after that? I'm going to tell you what happened after that. I serviced the hell out of him. I did what everybody listening would do, but I did 30% more. So when he went to Mexico, he expected me to return his call and D every EM, DM and all that. Of course, I did what everyone here would do. But he went to Mexico. He didn't expect a list of pediatricians that I vetted in case his kids got sick. Mm. He didn't expect me to make reservations every Wednesday at, at every night at eight o'clock during spring break in Mexico in case he and his wife wanted to go to dinner. And 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 after a couple of months of doing that, what he didn't expect me to do, he gave me the magic word. He gave me a referral. And that was rinse and repeat for for five years until we grew this. So no, I was never the CEO. I was never the, the the operator. I was never the COO. I was I wasn't even. I don't even think I was on the org chart. So <laughs> I'm 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 looking at your check this out. Well, you're on the website. I'm looking at I use Web Archive. I'm looking at the uh, the 2005 version of MarkyJet.com, and I'm looking at your about page. And what's interesting, it looks like your senior executive team was not only awesome, it was like amazing. Because Ken Austin, I see, was your executive VP. Is that the same Ken Austin? that went and started, is it Avion, the tequila company, and most recently started Proper 12 with Conor McGregor. Is, is that the same Ken Austin? And the tequila company with The Rock, yes. You've done a good job of hiring. <laughs> no, we were the Boston Celtics, man. <laughs> we, we were the Boston Celtics. We, from like the old, we, we, the talent at this company was exceptional. Ken Austin, is an exceptionally, I don't, he could be the, he is such a talented guy. And um, I learned so much from Ken and, you know, we had great sales reps and we attracted really good talent because we built a really good culture. Well, it's also a sick product. I mean, you said you met your wife there. It's like, that's like the greatest line ever. Like, oh, do you, you're here at this jet company. So I know like you're of someone, I know you're someone interesting. Definitely. Just so Definitely. happens I, I work here or I own the company. I mean, it's like a that's that's a it's a pretty uh, wonderful experience. I imagine to work at a private jet company. It was it was it really was, and you nailed it. But the only thing I would say to that is, I think there were like sixty five private jet companies that put a flag in the ground from when we started to when we sold, and I think we were the only one that made money. 
I might be wrong about that, but it's, it was something that some, including uh, Garrett Camp, the guy from Uber. He created, he tried to do an Uber for Jets uh, that didn't work out, right? It's it's very very difficult. And if we didn't have NetJets as a partner, I, you know, it wouldn't. Have, I'm sure it wouldn't have worked as well. So a lot a lot of things lined up. The for other us. business you did a partnership on was Zico Coconut Water, and uh, yeah. I think this is interesting because now we're seeing a pattern. The first is you're picking businesses in like categories that. They're not in the NBA curriculum. Nobody's thinking about, oh, sports teams need slogans and CDs that will increase their fandom. Nobody even realizes that that's a niche that you can go into or to do, you know, this membership model for private jets. Nobody's even looking in that area at the time, right? There's very few people are even thinking about that niche. It's not common. Then you go coconut water. So now you're consumer packaged goods in a beverage category that's non-existent really at the time. Uh, and I think Zico was pretty small when you found it. It's not like it had like, you know, tons of momentum. Um, so talk about two things. Number one, finding these niches. Like what, what is it that, that you, what is your operating philosophy that leads, that seems to consistently lead you to these? That's the first question. And the second is the key partnership that got it off the ground. I heard an amazing Matt Damon story. I want to hear the full version of it. <laughs> what was Zico? Yeah. Yeah. I spent a year trying to figure out how to have my own coconut water company. I went to Brazil. I went to Jamaica. Look, try to figure out. This is there were no there was no coconut water in the stores at the time. This is I'm a, so let me back it up even further. I was running a hundred mile race, and I did a lot of trick when I was doing my training. I did a lot of research around hydration and nutrition. If I'm going to run for arguably 24 hours, how many calories do I need to eat? Drink an hour. Um, how many calories do I need to take in an hour? How much fluid ounces do I need to drink an hour? How much salt do I need an hour? And my research led me to coconut water. So I ran this race powered by coconut water and I finished it in 22 hours and 30 minutes. When I was done, I'm like, this is going to be, this is the new Gatorade. No one knows about this. I'm the human guinea pig. I'm bringing this to market. You, you know, it's a better option. It's all natural. One ingredient, you know, it rains. God sends it up a tree, we crack it open and we drink it. Like this is, I mean, are you kidding me? So I spent a year trying to figure it out how to import it. And I realized like I did get a 980 on my SAT because I couldn't figure it out. But I knew I could market and sell it. I knew I could. So again, same model, same formula. I took it the idea to Coca-Cola. The president of Coke's Emerging Brands Division um, was friends with one of my customers at Marquee Jack. He got me a meeting. I pitched the meeting. Uh, I, in the meeting, I pitched this idea of coconut water. He takes the liking to me, but he says, we don't buy PowerPoints. We're Coca-Cola. We buy brands. <laughs> he goes, but if you partner with another company or something, you know, maybe we can, Then I, that, that's out there, that has proved that they can make the product, ship the product, get it in stores or whatever, We'll come in, we'll partner with you. So I went to Zico and that's how we formed the partnership. During the meeting, the um, a, about a week before, I was at um, Matt Damon's house and Matt was also a customer of a marquee jet. And I did the things that I did for Josh Koppelman with Matt and we became friends. And I said to Matt, you know, he'd asked me if I wanted to spend the night, they were going out. And I said, I'm going to Brazil in a day or two. I can't see, he goes, what are you doing in Brazil? I said, I'm starting a coconut water business. He's like, you gotta be kidding me. He's like, I love coconut. I have a coconut tree in my backyard. <laughs> He's like, I drink. Coconut. He goes, if anything happens, what you know, with this company, let me know. I may want to get involved. A month later in the meeting at Coke, like the meeting is going so bad. I'm showing him this PowerPoint, you know, like and and out of nowhere, like I know I had to change the whole Energy. feel of the yeah. meeting. I just turned to the president of the guy at Coke and I'm like, you know, my partner, Matt Damon and I, and the guy went, like, Matt Damon's your partner. I said, I didn't mention that. What are you talking about? <laughs> we go all the way to the one yard line. I leave and I call Matt. I'm like, Matt, I need a favor. He's like, <laughs> I'm like, can I come over with a cat? Can we climb up your tree, get a coconut, chop it open, you know, go in the kitchen, put a straw in it, you know, um, turn to the camera and say, Mutar, Mutar Kent, the CEO of Coke. There's got to be a better way than this. He's like, all right. And I filmed this, he filmed this award-winning 
friggin' 35 second short film of him getting a coconut, <laughs> chopping it open and saying, there's gotta be a better way. And, and we got the deal. And the creek, you know, what's interesting about that is obviously who's going to get, you know, a, a mega star to come. It, that's not the point. It's, it goes back to what I said. Um, will you make it work? Putting yourself in a situation where you can get lucky. Here's the other pattern, Sean, you're talking about patterns and making me, making yourself stand out and be memorable in a meeting. Now I stretched it a little with this one, <laughs> but, but, um, but it ended up, it ended up working out. That's an amazing story. That's amazing. <laughs> That's a good one. I love that story. I love that story. You. That's wild. By the way, Coke bought it two years later. Hundred <laughs> percent. Did you? Uh, when you bought, did you buy into Zico at the time? Like, did you? Uh, was that like a? Yeah. And have you made bets that you felt like financial bets that were risky? Like, you know, Elon does this thing where he sort of rolls all the proceeds into the next business and sort of regoes all in each time, which is you know probably not advisable to most, but like. What's your strategy been now that you have some chips to play with? Do you do you make big financial bets? Are you saying no, no? I'm going to add value strategically. Do you start things from scratch? What do you What do you like to do with the chips that as you accumulate them? How do you How have you used that to to your advantage? Well, I fe- I realized that I've got as I've gotten older that more isn't better. Better's better, and I really don't make a lot of bets. I have four kids. Um, what I'm most proud of, Sean, in my journey at 55 is that I've been I've I've exited five businesses, but I've been able to keep build a family, keep my health, you know, be a really good son to my parents. Um, I have great friends, so I really aren't I'm not, uh, and I'm not using Eli as an example. You you brought him up, not me, but I'm not trying to roll everything in or. Um, I'm really proud of what I've been able to do and I, I'm really proud of the life that I built. So I really don't, I really say no to most, I have this thing at this point in my life, if it's high aggravation for high reward, I'm not doing it. If it's, and that goes for anything, money, friends. I don't want high aggravating friends. I'm on friend reduction right now. I'm on friend reduction, man. <laughs> I want low aggravation. You're doing layoffs? For- you do Zoom calls with people? Layoffs. Let them know, hey, I'm sorry, we had to make a reduction in, in, in friendship. Listen, man, we're doing layoffs, hey. man. Excuse and, me, um, Mr. Damon, can you step out yeah. my office? <laughs> There's a severance package. We'll we hang out have- three more times, but then that's it. <laughs> we need to have a discussion. Uh, that's great. That's so funny. But I'm not trying to, you know, push it, really. It's like, it's based on enth- my enthusiasm for something, um, how's it going to impact my life? Meaning like day to day. Um, I walked away from several ideas that I think could be really good. Because cause you're like, just because you have a good idea doesn't mean you should do it. And I've, um, Sarah said that to me. I had an idea. Now I see people are doing it now. About eight years ago, I said, Sarah, I have an idea that's bigger than Marquee Jet. Like Marquee Jet was the biggest thing I'd done, you know? And, um, I told, walked her through it and she goes, that's an incredible idea. Don't do it. What was it? I wanted to take, this is going back eight years ago. So now it might sound like, oh, well, people are doing it now. I actually pitched this to a major airline now um, that's doing it. But I wanted to make commercial travel feel like private travel for people. I felt like there was a bit, and there still is an opportunity for people that would pay up to fly commercial, but they want an experience that's more private. So for example, if I'm flying from New York to California and I'm by myself and I'm on a global or a Gulfstream and I'm going round trip, that's an expensive flight, man. That is an expensive flight um, where I could just buy a first class ticket for maybe 1500 bucks. So instead of, let's say that that, co- that flight cost me, if you chartered it, maybe it's going to cost you, let's just say $50,000. It might be more, it might be less. I have no, I don't even know today what it is. But I could spend $50,000 on a private flight, which is amazing, or I could buy a first class ticket for $1,500. I, as a $1,500 ticket holder, would gladly give you another $1,500, United American, Delta, Frontier, whoever, if you could walk me through a back door and make me feel like Mick Jagger and escort me onto the airplane through the back door. And um, no one was doing it. No one was doing it. And now they are doing stuff like that. And that, that's smart. It's like you like unbundled the private 
experience. It's like, okay, there's the jet part of it, but then there's the right. walk onto the plane, yeah. walk off the plane. Once you get like, oh, right, because once you get on an airplane, do you really care? Doesn't, about you're yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm in one A. No one's bothering me in one A. And I'm in some like, regard, the commercial jet is safer. Yeah. You have more amenities. So yeah, like, I, but I've been on a. I flew first class uh, from New York to LA one time for like some meeting. I, would, I had never flown first class, but I did it because I had, it was overnight and I had to be ready for a meeting. And I get on, I was 1A and 1B or sitting right next to me was Stephen A. Smith. And I was like, how the fuck did you get on the plane before me? And I like looked it up and apparently there is like a private door, right. I guess, if you're famous. Uh, what, right. what is that? Well, I think now several airlines have it and there's services that do it outside of the airlines as independent services. But my point is, so I had the idea, but I also felt like I had the buy side that I could deliver to the airline because, you know, I'm involved with the M with some NBA players and um, I'm part owner of the Atlanta Hawks. And I, so I have, I have, and my friends are all doing really well that are, that are all doing really well. I thought we'd want to have this service. So I had the idea and a significant part of the buy side to package together to an airline to bring private flyers onto their mothership, which is the domestic part of their travel. But um, but anyway, to answer your question, so things like that, good ideas, lucrative, but does but for me at that point in my life, to put, I feel, I don't know if I have the energy to do, if it's going to take away from Tuesday's flag football game, I'm not doing it. And I don't know if I had that, if I still have, I don't, I don't still have that well you you but you can't turn that switch off right because i saw you on instagram like you know i don't know a year ago or six months ago or something like that and you were like pickles it's and you were like uh guys pickles and you know it seemed like you know the guy who was saying coconut water when nobody was talking about coconut water he's talking about pickles so me and me and ben started paying attention we we're like hey what's jesse it's doing with pickles well, okay, he's kind of right. Yeah. There's no brand in pickle. And so describe this pickles opportunity that you see now. Currently, this is present day now, right? We're done with the past. Now we're talking yeah. present and future. Um, what do you see in the pickle market? Well, like 245 million Americans eat pickles every year. It's like 75% of our population eat pickles. And again, it goes back to the to our running conversation. I'm starting to see at races pickles at the at the at the aid stations they never existed 10 years ago pickle juice never existed 10 years ago at at the aid stations of marathons and your local 5 help you with and running? now they're uh, yeah. yeah so that made my antenna it was that it has a lot of salt in it when i grew up all my black friends would say that they would drink pickle juice in order to avoid a hangover oh yeah in russia it's a it's a you know it's a big remedy for hangovers but my point is like it, made, it put my antennas up like what is this you know, just like when I saw the first thing of coconut water on a shelf, I'm like, what the hell is this? I just ran a hundred. I'm going to, so, so I started doing, so I started thinking about it and I'm like, you know what? I can't even name three pickle companies. And I, I love pickles. I don't even know. What <laughs> this is, by the way, this is the part where he's going to bring in a focus group of 10 people. And he's going to say, name <laughs> yeah. a pickle company and nobody could do it. And he's going to be like, that's the business plan. <laughs> well, listen, so I, 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 Research like the seven best tasting pickles and of the seven best tasting pickles i think it was like uh the today show did or something you know it's like it's like someone credible did it um i only knew one cup one of the companies so i'm like if i only know one of this top seven best tasting pickles there's a problem in the marketing of pickles it's a marketing problem and i'm a good marketer so and it, that's where it started. And I'm like, this is a category with no innovation, no fun. You know, 75% of Americans eat pickles. The average American eats like 10 pounds a year. That's more than cereal. And I'm like, I like it here. I like this space. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a pickle guy too, Jesse. Same. Is it Clawson, like the big brand? Is that right? I like Clawson. I like Mount Olive. Is it called uh, Valsic or v Vlasic? I, I like that company. But I think Mount Olives is the biggest ones. I always get the little ones that look like a witch's toe. Are you wearing a Mount Olive pickle shirt? Are I'm you, not. Look, you, I'm not. You know what I'm, saying? I'm not big. I, this is a big pickle. Around with a Clatterson. <laughs> what disrespect to that company? Or right? I don't even know. But I'm just saying, like, have you ever seen anyone wearing the hat? Jesse, like, oh my god, it's like I'm convinced. In fact, we're texting Mr. Beast right now. We're we're gonna come into this market too. You you just made a mistake, my friend. You're we're bringing our our influencers into this market. I, I believe you on this opportunity. 
why do that? Let's just let's get the beast on the phone. Let's, let's party with the beast. Beast pickles. That's right. That's right. Who needs Matt David? No, well, we, got, we got Jimmy now. I, I'll, yeah, where's David? I need to <laughs> go get Ben Affleck. He seems like a good pickle it's guy. Beast, I need to know about Beast is low aggravation, though. I only want the low aggravation part. Yeah, well, I don't know about that one. <laughs> Mount Olive does uh, $220 million in revenue a year, privately owned. It sounds, it sounds doable, man. Sounds like our money. Right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to thank them very much. For holding it for us. Yeah, for holding it. <laughs> yeah, right. Shoot a text over to the CEO of Olive and just let them know to keep that money warm for us, all right? <laughs> we'll be there soon. Um, you, what other ideas you got? Because I, I, I told you, I said, you know, uh, you'll get this because, you know, you're a, you know, you're a rap guy. When you go on certain shows like The Breakfast Club or Sway in the Morning, there's like an expectation. It's like, okay, if you come on here, you got to freestyle. And we're trying to do that of the business realm. Where it's like, you come on here, you got to bring fresh ideas. You can't just only talk about your history. And you go, you tell me, you go, I got 50 ideas in my top drawer. And I said, all right, say no more. But you hinted at me. By the way, uh, the, the, the pickle names sound like a rap name. Sweet Gherkin, Bread and Butter. <laughs> Kosher dill, like this, these are all rap names, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're about to have Migos pickles. Um, all right, <laughs> tell me, tell me about this idea. You you gave me three words. I don't know what the idea is, but you said ready made eight ounce drinks. What, what you got in mind? Yeah. So I mean, I I've been accumulating ideas in my in my top drawer for thirty five years. Um, I love starting things, Sean. You know, but um. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't, I don't mind. By the way, if you guys want to run, anyone wants to run with this, you can. I'll take a one penny <laughs> royalty. I'll give it to charity. Um, you know, I think like I go back to Five Hour Energy. The brilliance of Five Hour Energy is they took a, you know, twelve ounce uh, energy drink. They shrugged it down to two and a half ounces. Right, that's what Five Hour Energy was. And why did it work? They they only I believe I believe they only have predominantly sold stores that would put it on the countertop when they started out. So like it wasn't buried at GNC on the bottom shelf and it was like on the countertop at checkout impulse buy. They were selling 10 million two and a half bottle ounce bottles every week. 10 million. When I look at when you look around retail at the counter at checkout of retail, the countertop is incredibly crowded and you go to whole foods there's gum there's mints there's this there's that there's chocolates everywhere you go gas stations there's lottery tickets and blah, blah, blah. the only place that i found like where there's open area are liquor stores if you go into a liquor store you don't see the 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 the, the self stand you know the stands and the crowded space and all the tchotchkes and stuff that you see at gas stations and at, at grocery and, and and other retailers and um, I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity. I was going to call them quickies um, to have like ready-made shots. Same thing as as five out, like of your woo-woo lemon drop, whatever your favorite kamikaze ready-made drinks are, right at the countertop that are already made, fresh ingredients. You know where people could just come and grab and go and have a ready-made cocktail that they can bring to tailgates, parties, etc. I'm not saying it's gonna it's gonna be great goose vodka, but I see an opportunity. And if not that, someone should go make a deal and and in a very fragmented. Okay, now you got me thinking, Sean. Now I'm not, this wasn't even on my radar, but here we go. <laughs> like the freestyling exactly. shit you were talking about, I was playing that. Um, really, even a better idea would be to go. It, liquor stores are that is the most fragmented market out there. They're all mom and pops. There's no like chain of liquor. I mean, not, like, you know, you go to your local liquor store. It's like the guy, my neighbor owns a liquor store. I go there and I get the wine and this and that. Do a roll up. Go pay someone for, go rent the countertops of all the liquor stores and then go to Nabisco or one of the big boys and be like, hey, guess what? I own 10,000 countertops. You want to put your <laughs> widget there? You want to put your fucking widget there? Keep the money warm, Sean. Yeah, keep the money warm, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, the, the real we estate. Could probably, we could probably talk for 15 minutes about the opportunity and come up with 10 ideas around that. You know, that's where it starts. It starts with just like bad idea or better idea, the idea. Right. 
yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it, uh, you, you're kind of like, I think the background of rap. I'm not, I'm not joking about this. I, I think the the way the brain can sort of like Bits. not censor itself and wait till it has a fully formed, perfect idea, but actually just start to go and then know that oh, I'm gonna hop from this to this to this to this. And there, yeah, that'll be the line, and that's all I need to do is get to that one, that one line. I, I'm gonna show you this too. This is this is something I'm selling now. This is I don't know. If, are we on? Are we just I saw this on this. YouTube too? Are we on? Yeah, all in here. No, we, video, we, video, we, video. We this is by 2024, all planned out. This is next year, fully, almost fully baked. What my year looks like, my races, my what's, what's um, orange? There's a lot of orange on that. What does orange stand for? Orange, orange of our so. When Sarah sold Spank, she wanted to do a lot of traveling. So this year we committed as a family to go on the road. So all the orange, as crazy as this looks, is all travel. Oh, wow. We're going to Africa. We're going to New Zealand. But it's all mapped out. Yellow. What's, so ye orange, what's yellow and what's what's green or, or blue, whatever that is? Yellow are my races and events. Green is my speaking. Uh, green is, oh, birthdays and stuff. This yeah. thing's dope. Now, blue. I, I wanted to ask you about this because you are – super legit as far as like what you've actually been able to accomplish your level of success and you do stuff like this you have like the big ass calendar club or whatever <laughs> it's like that thing is called big ass calendar that's a product you make it's like a course you have and um i'm always surprised that you're doing those things and uh, you know what what's your thought process on like or the running club or the running club like how do you pick projects yeah i mean i think this goes back to the earlier question you asked me about reinvesting in other businesses and stuff like that. Um, how old are you guys? How old are you, Sam? 34. I'm 35. So I got I got two decades on you guys. Um, and but I got I got the most experiential decades, I believe, on you guys. Your the 40s and 50s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, you know, for me, there's I'm in I'm in a coaching space, you know. Um um, I speak a lot. I have coaching programs, the calendar, but even the events that I do, the run, running races and this kind of stuff, it, it all has an element of getting people to do more than they thought, to inspire people to do more than they thought they could. But, but to answer your question, and the reason why I just said that is um, the gal who works with us in our family office was looking at all the businesses and, um, and asking me, like, I don't have a sales rep. Um, on my payroll. I don't, I'm not going crazy on the marketing and this and that. And it's really word of mouth. And she looked at the numbers and she's like, you know, do you want to scale this? And what are you doing? Why don't you, why don't you just go do the liquor idea or the airplane idea or this idea or that idea or any of the ideas in your drop? And I pulled out my phone and I said, Kendall, all of these are from today. All of these messages are for today. Pick one. Read it. I said, I can't, and it was like, you changed my life, or this has really inspired me, or you, you know, I did this, or I saw my parents. I haven't seen my parents in a long time. And, you know, I talk about the importance of that very often, you know, about not losing sight of what you already have while you're chasing your entrepreneurial dream, your health, your family, your friends. There's no business in the world that would give me the return on investment that I'm getting right now. There's nothing I could do. What, build another marquee jet, work 20 hour days? I mean, like, that's not going to give me that sense of impact, legacy for my kids, um, and just the feeling, quite honestly, that I have. I mean, like, it's indescribable. A wire is a wire. You get the wire, and it's like the same feeling you get when when you sell a business is the same feeling you get when you finish the mar a marathon, you walk an old lady across the street, or you do anything that makes you feel good about yourself. I swear to God, and I have the right to say that because I sold five of them. I have the right to say that. It's the same feeling. And for the for for very very for a lot of people chasing that, waiting 20 years to sell a business or something to have that feeling, when I feel like I get that every single day. And that's a really powerful place to be in your life at 55. And and that's the reason, man. And and so you're right. I have these businesses and you know, there's no real plan around them. People are like, what's your, what? I don't, I don't know. I'm just enjoying how it's making me feel right now. And what's wrong with that? I got to scale just to scale because everyone told me I have to scale. I don't want to do that, man. Right. I did that. So a question that we like to ask people is, 
it's a really simple question, but we we learn a lot, which is like, what do you do with your money? So like you have a really interesting lifestyle. I agree with you. I'm not I, I don't like the Elon Musk path of uh, all these sacrifices and uh, um, doing things for the sake of humanity. I'm like, I'd rather have a fun life. And you have a really sick life. I mean, I, I, I I'm I'm a former college athlete runner. So I, I like watching what you're doing. Um, and I like to work out and do these podcasts and have a lot more fun than just work. What do you do with your money? Um, and um, when you're financing it, this, are you just, are you using your speaking fees to finance it? And then you have your marquee jet money in just one big account in the, in the markets. How, how's your portfolio set up and what are you doing with your money? Well, just, you know, it's, um, I don't know, man. Like we, we, we never really think about it that much. I know that's, I don't want to belittle it or sound in any way obnoxious. In fact, I'm incredibly grateful, but like it goes back to the relationship with money from the beginning of the conversation. Um, we're not trying to triple it or quadruple our money. Like we don't really think about it. It's like it's spread out strategically and we live our life. What's your monthly burn? I mean, what what does one need to spend uh, per month to, ha to to do that? I like to ride my bike. <laughs> I like to run. I like to swim. I like to speak in public. I like to be around my family and friends. What whatever that costs me, Sam, is what I'm going to spend on it. How's that for an answer? <laughs> yes, Sam. <laughs> but I still love you, Sam. <laughs> Um, well, I want to ask you about something that you have talked about that I really liked, which is uh, around your life philosophies. So you have a few of these that have made an impact on me. You, um, I don't know where I saw it, some TikTok clip or something. You were talking about like this three minute daily thing. You go three minutes and I forgot exactly how you phrased it, but it was like, compl you go, I, I can network in three minutes, right? I, I can, I can invest in my friends, my, my, my network. In, in just three minutes a day, and I'm always interested in anything that's like, you know, the six minute abs. I, I I tend to be interested in the like, you know, shorter time frame type things. And you go compliments. What was the other ones? You go compliments. Um, Complimenting, congratulating, consoling. consoling. Explain that that philosophy because I've been doing that now where I, I basically go through my text list and I'm like, who's somebody I could compliment? Boom, send it out. And they love it because they're like, uh, you know, I'm thinking of them. We haven't talked in a little while. It's really simple for me to do. This is like kind of like a, a actually like a very effective little tip. I want you to share it with here. Well, in my 20s, I didn't have a way to, to I had no, I was really on a super tight budget. I was writing 10 handwritten letters. I went a year, not every single day, but pretty much writing about 10 handwritten letters a day. And that was my entire marketing strategy. And I realized that, you know, it, it's a great way to get through the, the clutter of email, DM, social, you know, all this stuff. Because a lot of people don't check their emails or their assistant does or whatever, but everyone reads a handwritten letter. So I, the three minutes a day is, you know, I had sent a text. You mentioned the K Academy, Coach K. I sent a, uh, flew into Carolina um, not too long ago, and I sent Coach a, a text thanking him for having the event. And I said, you don't have to respond. I just want to let you know, like it makes me feel like an eight year old for five days a year. I want to thank you for, for doing this. I know you don't have to do it. And it took, and like, I realized like he might share that with his team, like we're having an impact. Like, look at, look at this note or tell his wife, he might do nothing. But now if I see coach K, I have permission to go over to him and say, coach, I sent you a text. Like, I don't know if you got it, but like I had that permission to do it. I'm not coming out of left field. Like, Oh, Hey coach. You know, like, well, you just, so that took me 45 seconds to hit send, write it and hit send. So I was like, okay, if I did three of those a day and just took three minutes and just started hitting friends, suppliers, manufacturers, influence, whatever, over the course of a year, I'll send a thousand. I will plant a thousand permission slips all over the country and world three minutes a day. So in carpool line, when I take my kids to school or pick them up, I just fire off a couple of emails or call them or whatever. So that was that theory. The compliment congratulated consoling is really just kind of three things that I, I like to, to remind myself to do to maintain and build authentic relationships, authentic relationships, not relationships, authentic relationships. So for example, 
if you have somebody in your life that's grieving and you don't reach out to them and you guys are young, but you'll see in the next 10 years, friends will start to get diagnosed with stuff. Parents, grandparents are going to pass away. Like your life's going to change, man. If you have someone that's grieving and you don't reach out to them, they will never forget it. They'll never, oh, they, 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 if you can't, human nature, you can't even help but take inventory who reached out and who did. You're just aware. I just lost my father. I know everybody that called me. I know everybody that didn't call me. And the people that didn't call me don't get a pass. They don't get a pass. So you always want to consult. The people that, it, you know, something happens to a friend in your life that's great, you want to congratulate them, you know? And then you want to compliment. You know, Sean, man, Sam, listen, you guys have an uh, amazing podcast. You did it yourself. You know, you guys decided to like sold some businesses and here you are, you know, bringing on inspiring people to inspire entrepreneurs all over the world. And um, I just want to congratulate on, you on your success, man. I'm not, you know, I, you just call someone out of nowhere. You and default to calls or texts? Either way. I just think I personally like handwritten letters. Here's one. Um, because I feel like the intent, it takes a little longer, but to actually get a stamp, lick it, go to the mailbox, put it in the mailbox, it's received completely different than just sent. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so if I was like in the pecking order, but you don't have the ability to do that. It takes too long. But at the end of the year, I do like to write 25 to 50 handwritten thank you letters every year. I have a whole close out the year process that I kind of teach people, but like, and that's one of them, you, you know, but you compliment, you graduate and consult and you do that to people. And like, if I, Sam, if I hit you up, God forbid you had something bad and, and, and I don't even know, I just met you for the first time. Other than the question about how my burr rate, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so if I, if I were to call you up after one meeting and say, Sam, man, I heard about X, Y, Z. Man, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then four months later, I'd call you up and say, Sam, man, you guys just hit 5 million downloads a day. Congratulations, man. And then I'd call you up again at the end of the year. I said, Sam, I just want to let you know, man, that question you asked me about, about my burn rate, you know, I would rethought it and I want to compliment you because you asked the tough questions. And you know what? That's the seat that you're in. And I give you credit for asking questions like that to people on the other end. And I really admire you for that. I do those three things in that year. You're going to think differently about Oh, you'll me. be his hero. <laughs> you'll be all of our heroes, to be honest with you. That'd be incredible. <laughs> all right. Well, well, Dad? Sean, come on, come on, come on, come on. Sean, you laugh about that. And we're laughing about it. But let me ask you a question. Who doesn't want to be a hero? You're right. Who doesn't want to be a hero? We, like, if you're telling me I don't, I don't have to run into a building and save save someone, I can just do that and I could be a quote unquote hero. Like, you know what? I built my career doing that. Well, so this is about relationships, but you also have others about skill building, life experiences. Explain some of your other kind of life rules because I think these are really worth sharing. You know, people I think will be entertained and inspired by the business stories. But my hope is that that actually was just buying the right to drop a little wisdom on them at the end here because this is the stuff I've liked the most from you from your story um so so tell talk about you know the, the sort of misogi or the the uh, Kevin's rule like these are pretty foundational yeah well that goes into kind of the planning that I showed you on the calendar and um I really have to do, do two or three things every year um at the beginning of the year this is actually perfect timing I don't know when this is going to air but like November December when you look into 2024 or the next year I try to have one big year defining thing on my calendar every year. Last year was my bike ride across America. 2015, it was living with the seal, the book I wrote. 2017, I lived on a monastery. 2016 or something, I started 29029, this company with my partner. So there's an old Japanese ritual called the Misogi. And we took the liberty to kind of create our own version of what that means. But basically, it means that every year you do one, or the way I've interpreted it is you do one big year defining thing. And you had, you should have something to show for it every year. By the way, if you're 35 years old, I don't want to, I don't just rounding up here, um, and you live to be 85, so you have that would be 50 year defining things between now and the end of your and the end of your run that you have on your life resume. 
That's pretty damn incredible. The second thing I do is something I call Kevin's Rule, named after my friend Kevin, um, which is every other weekend, I do something I normally wouldn't have done. Like, instead of watching like a George, the Georgia football game, I might take my kids fishing. I might go to a conference. I might, you know, um, watch, spend a couple of hours learning something I, I didn't know. Um, I coined it Kevin's Rule because Kevin and I were camping at Mount Washington with our kids. And it was like, I go, Kev, there's eight, it's like the winter, it's snowing, we're sleeping outside in a minus 40 sleeping bag, minus 20 sleeping bag. I'm like, Kev, there's 8 billion people in the world, man. It's only us on this mountain. You know, it, it, how often do you do this? Because he invited me. He's like, oh, every other week, he's a police officer. I do so every other month. I do something I normally wouldn't have done. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, so at the end of the year, I got six mini adventures. If you're 35 and you live to be 55 and you have six mini adventures, that's 300 mini adventures and 30, 50, I'm sorry, 50 year defining things, your Masogi, and 300 mini adventures. Sean, I don't care how much money you have or how little money you have. At the end of your run, if I go to you and you're 85 years old on your deathbed and you're like, Jesse, man, thank you. I took your advice listening to my podcast and I now have 50 unbelievable adventures. I've done the Grand Canyon. I've taken my family here and I have 300 mini adventures that I've done. And by the way, it only took six days of the 365 days of the year, seven days of the 365 days of the year. It's a 2%. Is that 2%? 6%? What is that? We have a rule here. We don't do public math. So don't worry. You're off the hook. Okay, there we go. <laughs> That's a great run. That's a great run. Have you ever hung out with Rob Dyrdek? You, you guys are really similar. We had him on, um, and I i think I've said publicly, he's one of my favorite people. Uh, and you have this similar quality where you just have a framework, and you know what you like, and you stick to it, and you're really intentional, you, and I appreciate that. You live life that. on your terms, which is what I think the highest calling thing we respect on the pod is somebody who defines their own terms and then lives on them, even if you don't, even if somebody doesn't Because even successful them. people don't yeah. do that. Like, even people who are wealthy, they're like, I fucking hate my life because I'm tied to this job that I actually don't like doing. And you're a great example. Your 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 definition tends to be exciting and awesome because you do all these adventures. But it doesn't matter what your your definition of of like your framework is. You've done a cool job of defining it and sticking with it, and I appreciate that. Well, one cool thing that's different is Rob's is all about maximizing. He's like efficiency. How much? How do I use my time? How do I allocate it? And how do I get the most done in that time? Whereas I feel like Jesse's almost like it's a different relationship with time. It's like, how do I have the maximum number of, of incredible experiences um, and amazing relationships and moments, whether that moment took five seconds or, you know, five days or f five weeks, it doesn't really matter. It's like maximizing kind of like the, squeezing the juice out of, out of the fruit, you know, versus, versus, uh, you know, trying to optimize every moment. In, 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 in a generation of hustle and grind, which is so obvious, no shit. You got to work hard. That message gets lost. And you don't want to give up your 20s and your 30s and your 40s and certainly not your 50s if you can avoid it just grinding and chasing something that you can get the same feeling doing something else. Well, we feel lucky for having, having you on. Uh very early on on the podcast, Sam introduced me to a guy, Mike Brown, and he said one line on the pod that changed my life. He goes, uh, he goes, yeah, my theory of life is find the people that you love and then do life with them. And I just thought, oh, if there's a North Star for me, like that's the new North Star. Uh, you know, maybe something, maybe something more wise will come take its place, but that's it. And uh, that's the pod.